Hey, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Angular Elements today. Uh, I'm Rob Bormald, if you don't know me. I'm uh, now a developer programs engineer on the Google team. I do uh, Angular at Google. I used to be a developer advocate. A developer programs engineer is the same job. I just do slightly less slide decks and slightly more code. So that's really what's changed. Uh, as the guy said, I started the NGRX project. I don't really do much on that project. I've handed it over to Mike and Brandon. They do an excellent job running it. Uh, and now kind of one of my main roles on the Angular team is dealing with web standards. So I talk to a lot of the, you know, the browser teams who are doing standards, a lot of the teams who are proposing standards. It's kind of my wheelhouse now. So we're going to talk about elements today. Uh, we're going to talk about web components kind of in general. Uh, we're going to talk about what we're going to release in the 6.0 uh, release this week or next week. Uh, and then kind of the future of elements and where we're going to go with them and kind of how we're thinking about stuff. So uh, web components. Raise your hand if you've heard of web components in the room. Most of you, that's more than last time. Raise your hand if you've ever written a web component. That's a significantly smaller number. OK. So web components are a set, and set is an important word here, of web platform APIs uh, that let you create new custom reusable HTML tags uh, to use in web pages. And the important thing here is that they can, used, they can be used in any JavaScript library or framework that works with HTML. And I said that word set. So I like to say that there's actually no such thing as a web component. It's kind of an idea. They're made up of a, a set of standards. And the one I want to talk about today is custom elements. So custom elements are an API that basically allow you to create new DOM elements. So we all use buttons and divs and spans. And custom elements give you the ability to actually create your own elements. right? And so it takes two things. You create an ES6 class. So we have a Hello World class here. That extends from an HTML element. And then we register it with the browser through this custom elements API. So we say to the browser, if I do hello world on the page, then go ahead and start up this class for me. Uh, they have lifecycle hooks. So this connected callback gets fired when you uh, add this thing to the DOM or when it gets you know, parsed by the browser. Uh, if you remove it from the DOM or you destroy it, then this disconnected callback fires. Uh, you can have attributes. So DOM elements use attributes. You can basically register interest in an attribute. And then you have a callback that any time that attribute changes, this attribute changed callback will fire. Uh, and they also have properties, right? So you can set and get properties because it's just an ES6 class, right? It's like any other class you've written. Uh, and then, of course, they do events, right? So you know, if you listen inside of a custom element, then you can dispatch an event to the outside world. So you just do that by saying this.dispatch event and creating a new custom event. So Angular Elements, the project I've been talking about, is really just Angular components kind of glued together with this custom elements API. And so if we were going to write kind of a very basic hello world Angular component, we would basically start with a standard Angular component here. We're going to have a selector on it. It's going to have a template. We've got a little bit of data binding. We've got an ng model. We've got some button listeners, right? So it's kind of a basic standard Angular component. And what we want to do is kind of package this up and turn it into a real DOM element, turn it into a custom element. So we do that by, you know, just like you do today in Angular, Nothing new here. You've all written components like this. You know, we have an ng module. We bring in the imports. So we're going to use the browser module here. Uh, we, have, we have declared that this module or this uh, element belongs to this module. And then we add it to this entry components array. One thing to notice is I'm not saying bootstrap this component, right? I'm not actually adding it to the bootstrap array. Instead, I'm passing in this kind of ng do bootstrap callback. And I'm not going to do anything with it. But what this basically tells Angular to do is go ahead and start up this module, right? but don't actually start up the component. Don't try to render the component. Just start up this kind of context, if you like. And then what we do is basically we go ahead and bring in our platform. right? So I'm using the dynamic platform here, create an instance of the platform, and then go ahead and bootstrap my module. Uh, if you've done this with AOT, it looks almost exactly the same. right? So we use the platform. We go ahead and bootstrap this module. Most people, though, when they're at Angular apps today, kind of don't do this last then callback, right? They just bootstrap because what happens is your app starts up, right? And then you're kind of in your app and you're running. But because we're not bootstrapping a component here, what we're actually doing is just creating a module, creating an instance of this module, and we get this module ref, right? So this is returned to us, and this is basically Angular saying, here's a reference to this context that we've created. And Maxim's talk really covered a lot of this, this kind of injector stuff. But really what we're doing is creating the instance and injector here and Angular is going to call us back. So if we want to turn this thing into a custom element, all we have to do is bring in this new custom elements API. So this is from the Angular elements package. This is going to come into v6. There is only one function in this package. This is create custom element package. And we're going to do two things here. 
So the first thing we're going to do is going to pass it into this create custom element function. We're going to pass our component in. And we're also going to pass in the injector that came from the module that owns it, right? So we have to get a hold of this injector, which has the render and all these different things. And we're basically going to create this custom element. And what you get back, this const, or this uh, hello world element here on the left side, this is that ES6 class that you saw me do a few slides ago, right? So all we're doing is internally, we're kind of minting a new class for you and hanging it back. And then I hand that to the exact same custom element CPI, right? So I say, OK, browser, here's an ES6 class that's got my Angular component inside of it. It's kind of connected to this Angular context. And we're going to go ahead and tell the browser this is what this is. Uh, and then you know, there's another way to do this. This is like a slightly more sugared way of doing that, where internal to that ng do bootstrap method, right? I can kind of register it in there. These two are functionally equivalent. This is maybe a little bit cleaner, because when you start it up, you know, all you have to do is this. So this would actually start up the module, fire that ng do bootstrap callback, go ahead and register our element, and then we're off and running. So how do I use it? I just put in the DOM, right? So put in HTML, I can just put the tag in the name, I can do attributes, right? And so this name attribute you see here is linked up to that name input that I defined on the component. We've glued those two things together, so when we change the name in the DOM, that will be reflected in the Angular component. Uh, we can create them imperatively, right? So we can, just like you do with any other element, you can document.create element on it, you can append it to the body, you can set a property on it here as I'm doing. You can set attributes on it, right? So again, if I set the property hello world.name, that's going to be sort of reflected into my Angular component on the inside. Set that property and run change detection. Same thing happens with an attribute, right? We can set an attribute that will trigger change detection, update the view. We can add event listeners. So we had an output on that component that was kind of emitting outputs to the outside world. We link those things up as well. So when you dispatch from the output inside of your component, you know, it, people who are consuming this element can listen to it with that name of the event. And again, this is just a standard DOM add event listener API. I don't know why I have that twice. Yep, so again, add listening, you know, it's, it's, this is very, very standard stuff. There we go. One thing that kind of helps, I think, if you've not used this before, the mental model is a bit interesting. And, and really, the easiest way to think about this is we've all used the host kind of idea in Angular, right? We've done host bindings, we've done host listeners. We use this word host a lot. And in Angular Elements, the host is the custom element. They are the same thing. So you know, if I inject my element ref, as we've all done before, the native element that's on that element ref, that is that custom element. That's that thing we've created, right? So the thing to keep in mind here is you have your Angular component. It's exactly the same as it was before. And we're sort of wrapping it in this, this custom element, this class. Also, you know, if you do a host listener, right, what we're saying here is listen to clicks on this element. So the person who's using this element, if they click on it, we can then propagate that event internal to our component so we can deal with it. Same thing with host binding, right? So we can take an attribute, you know, if this is a selected thing, we can reflect that to the outer sort of element that's owning our thing. And it keeps everything in sync. And this is just a helpful kind of way to think about it, that you can think about an Angular element as just the host, right? It's a, it's a real thing. You've used this before. Nothing really shiny and new. This is the first question that comes up, right? We all use Angular because it has stuff like dependency injection. Can I use dependency injection with custom elements or with Angular elements? Short answer is yes. We'll dive into this a little bit. Um, I'm glad that Maxim went before me because he did a really good job in kind of talking about this hierarchy and injectors and how they all get wired up together. But at a very simple level, you can kind of think about it as three levels. You have your platform injector. So when you do platform browser, internally we're creating an injector. And that injector owns things like the renderer and the sanitizer. And then you have your module, the little uh, hello world module we created. You know, it might have services that are kind of shared. And typically, in an Angular application, you'd add your services to your engine module. Same thing works here. And then the component has its own injector, and that's where you get things like the element ref and the change detector ref. Custom elements or Angular elements work exactly the same way. It's the same hierarchical system. That's why you know, when we get to this kind of screen where we're creating this instance of the module and wire everything up, what I'm grabbing is the injector here. And this injector, right, is coming from the platform injector. And then a child has been created from the Hello World module entry factory. So we've got the renderer and then any services in the module. And then we're registering it with this custom element so that it's kind of baked into the thing that we're registering with the browser. So why do we have to do this up front? Why do we need to do this injector when we register it? Well, the answer is because if you use a custom element like this, there's no chance for you to pass in an injector, right? Like, you don't have any access to how this thing is created. It's the browser 
that's creating all this stuff for you. So you don't have any way to do it here. So we have to register that, that injector ahead of time, right? This is cool because you know, if you had, for example, an NGRX store in your module, you could actually share that across all of the custom elements on the page. So you get this kind of shared context, which is a really, really powerful idea. So again, we can kind of use it declaratively. The other problem is here, right? Like in the same case, if we do document our create element, this is a browser API. It doesn't know anything about dependency injection. So we don't have an opportunity to pass in an injector, right? It's already created it, everything's been booted up, and we have no chance to do it. And this is kind of one of the main reasons that Angular didn't use uh, custom elements early on in the design, because we had this restriction where we couldn't really get the injector in where we needed it, right? One of the cool things that's come in the new custom elements API is a kind of slightly more powerful way of constructing elements. So I'm using this custom elements.get API, and basically what this does is give me back the class that I registered with the browser, right? So I created that thing with create custom elements, and then I handed it to the browser. But at any point, I can say, give it back to me, right? And I, now I have basically this constructor on the left side. I can then just new it up and create a new instance of it, and I can you know, append that to the DOM or whatever. But we've got this hook now that if we want to, if we wanted to pass in a slightly different injector, if I was in a different context, you know, a different life cycle of my application, I can actually just pass another injector in here. So this is a new thing that comes to the new custom elements API that really kind of opens the door for some very, very interesting things. So just to keep in mind, right, there are basically three ways we can do this. We can create them in the DOM. We just put an element in the DOM. The browser will start it up for us. We can use that document.create element API, which we've used, you know, for a long time. And then there's this new, slightly more powerful API that lets us pass in an extra injector if we want to. Uh, the other question that always comes up here is content projection or transclusion, as you may know it. Uh, this works, right? So this is, if you've not done this before, this might be what your template looks like. You know, you might have some standard data binding. And you use this ng content tag to basically say to Angular, uh, go ahead and insert anything that I kind of put in the, the, the child of this. And that looks like this, right? So I have my elements. And if I were to put some content in there, that would then be kind of projected into that ng content area in the page. So the final result looks something like this, right? This is just transclusion, excuse me, transclusion or content projections, we call it. So this works as expected. I put an asterisk here, though. There's a couple of gotchas just to be aware of here. So the first is because we are doing this uh, kind of not in a, in a static fashion, the way that Angular does everything today is very static, content projection works as long as you do it uh, sort of when the page is rendered for the first time. So we put this asterisk there. The other thing that doesn't work yet, and this is something we're going to look at solving between 6 and 7, is using content child or the content children queries because then they were, they were sort of designed for a very static world. And so we haven't yet linked those things up, but we think in general this should be useful for people, and again, we will kind of optimize these APIs over the next six months or so. There's another thing, though. This is the other part of the, the Web Components APIs is the shadow DOM, right? So typically this is about view encapsulation and having styles that don't leak all over the page. Uh, you know this as view encapsulation.native in Angular. You're already using shadow DOM if you're using view encapsulation. And part of these, this Shadow DOM API is this new idea of slots. And slots are basically the native version of what ng content does. So this is super experimental. This is a thing that you can try today. Fair warning, you may find bugs with this because this is not a thing that we've done a huge amount of work on. Again, this will be something we get much closer to with Ivy. But effectively, you can put a slot on the page. You must use native Shadow DOM. So I'm just turning that on with the view encapsulation.native. And then the same thing works, right? So you can use a slot on the page, compose some content into it. You know, the other cool thing that slots give you is named slots. So just like ng content, you can have named content projection. Slots have the same ability, so you can say this slot has a name, and then you know target content to go into a specific one of these slots. So this is really helpful when you're doing composition, you know, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples of this. Uh, but this is something that, you know, it's useful when you're building pages, especially that are being server-side rendered, and you want to kind of say, I have this shell that I'm giving you then I'm going to give you some content we're going to project into the element. So this works. Again, this is something you can do today. We have some optimization to do here, and we'll talk more about that in the future. Why are we doing this? So use cases. Uh, I've talked a lot about this in the kind of previous talks about elements, and I could talk for an hour about the motivation behind this. I'm not going to. You can go back and watch those talks if you're interested. But we kind of broke this down into three sort of main use cases. And we started in kind of elements in Angular applications, right? So you're all writing big Angular apps. You're all doing this every day. And there are things we can do with custom elements that make it better to write Angular applications. And we're going to dive into one of these on angular.io. 
But things like the dynamic components, right? You all know how to use the, uh, what is it, the component factory resolver dot resolve component factory method, right? Custom elements let you do the same thing in a much, much simpler fashion. Uh, and then they open up some new things for things like server-side server rendering and hybrid rendering. Uh, Vikram's going to talk about this a little bit later, so that's worth checking out. So this is the thing we wanted to focus on kind of as the first step. So we started with Angular.io. Uh, we use Angular.io, our, our, our website, to really dog food a lot of new things that we try out. So like Igor did a talk on SEO this morning. We learned all that stuff doing uh, Angular.io work, and we did the same thing for custom elements. So if you look at the Angular website, most of it is static HTML content, right? It's mostly a bunch of text that is just kind of written by our, our docs authors and kind of projected into the page. What's important to know is these are not, this whole, all this HTML on this page, it's not an Angular component, right? We haven't packaged this up. It's not in an Angular template. It's just static HTML. And we do that because it doesn't really make sense to turn all this static content into dynamically rendered things. So we have a bunch of static HTML. But a lot of the docs have little kind of embedded widgets to functionality, right? They have kind of doc blocks here. So, you know, this kind of blue bordered thing, you know, we're, we're rendering on the page, it's an element, and then we're kind of projecting content into it. Uh, the tabs panel here, right? So this is like an interactive widget. You know, we've got tabs going on. Uh, and we want to be able to basically use these elements in the page and let our docs authors just say, right, this is a tab panel and put some content in it and not have to worry about how do I actually start this up? How do I bootstrap these components? If you've ever done that, it's a not a simple thing to do. Our docs authors now, all they really have to do is just drop this thing on the page, and the custom element will go ahead and boot it up automatically. So it's pretty cool. Uh, the API list, this is a custom element. This is the first one we built. So like this is just the whole kind of page here is just a custom element that you render. It's got a whole bunch of really interactive functionality, right? It's got searching and querying and all this other stuff but it's packaged up in this kind of custom element fashion, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can actually check this out on the Angular repo. Uh, so all of these things are now custom elements. Uh, this took something like two hours to port from uh, kind of the old style to the new style, and we were surprised at really how easy that was. Uh, and so this is actually on uh, next.angular.io right now. You can try this out, you can poke around. All of these little kind of embedded widgets you'll see are custom elements. Uh, and this will become obviously part of angular.io when we release the stable version. So containers, this is the kind of next part, right? So uh, kind of the next part of this is thinking about applications and kind of packaging them up so they can be used in different contexts. So you, write, might, you, know, you might write something like a chat widget or a support widget or something that you want to drop into another page. It's a full application, right? It's got all of its dependencies, DI, HTTP, all this stuff, and you want to kind of package it up in a way so that people can consume it. Uh, this more or less you can do today. Uh, there's this kind of new term floating around called micro front ends, right? And this is something we think is pretty interesting. So we wanted to make sure that these, these cases were covered. So these first two kind of elements and applications, stuff like AIO and CMS, and these kind of container ideas, these are more or less ready to go today. You can use them now. We're already using them on angular.io. So this is something you can try out. These are kind of the first two cases we wanted to attack. The third is the one I've talked about a lot, and this is this kind of idea of reusable widgets, right? So date pickers. Nobody likes writing date pickers. It would be super cool if we could just use the material date picker in every app that we build. And so this is kind of the third step of, of Angular Elements. This is possible today. If it's something you really want to do, you can do it. Come and talk to me. I can talk you through it. But this is not the thing we're optimizing for today. And really, the main reason for that is size, right? Angular itself as an application framework is pretty big. And so today, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense that you'd ship a date picker and kind of bring along all this dependency, right? But if you were paying attention to the keynote this morning, we've talked about this, right? This is something that we're working on with Ivy to make this much smaller. And so let's talk about that for a second. So we have these kind of two really interesting projects that are going on at the moment. Elements, which has been developed for the past six months or so, Ivy around the same, but they've been kind of happening in parallel. The teams have been talking to each other a lot, like we're paying attention to each other very much, and what I'm really excited about is when we get to converge these two APIs. So this is speculative, but we're thinking it'll look something like this. So rather than going through all of that kind of configuration we were doing in the earlier slides, we want you to be able to really just denote this is going to be a custom element in the metadata, and it would be the compiler's job to kind of download this to that defined custom element call that we're doing, right? So this is kind of speculative, but we think this is kind of the direction we're heading. So we'd like you to start using these custom elements today. If it makes sense for your use cases, give us feedback, and we'll kind of roll all that feedback into the next kind of generation of, of elements. 
So we go back to this kind of hello world thing that they showed in the keynote this morning, right? When you have an application that is 2.7K compressed, then it does make sense that you have a date picker that you can just bundle up with no external dependencies and share that with the outside world. So uh, Elements itself would add like maybe, maybe 2% to these things. So you might see like 2.7.5 KB. It's a really, really lightweight wrapper because most of it's already in the browser. So we, we expect this is going to be a really, really nice thing when they converge, and we expect that to happen around v7. Uh, quick note on production readiness. So as of today, uh, it is in Chrome stable. Uh, it is in Firefox's nightly. So the, we expect the next release of Firefox will have custom elements ready to go. Opera and even Safari have shipped custom elements as stable. It's in all the iOS devices now. So we're almost ready to go. Our friends at Edge have not yet shipped this. Uh, there is an issue on their user voice site for custom elements. If you want to go upvote that, that would be cool. Uh, one of the things I'm really hopeful for is that like, Angular is a big project. right? We have a lot of developers using this. And it's my, my sincere hope that as Angular starts to push into custom elements, the Edge team will go, ah, OK, we should probably do that. I think Sean Larkin's here, so maybe go poke Sean Larkin, and he can tell somebody as well. Uh, in the interim, we can polyfill this back to IE9. Uh, there's a couple sets of polyfills. Uh, one of them is provided by the Chrome team. Uh, one of them is provided kind of from open source. We can polyfill all the way back to IE9. I give that asterisk there because, again, there are certain things that only the browser can do, and we can polyfill sort of 95% of the way. For most use cases, you should be able to do what you need to do with IE9. So for me, this is really just the beginning of kind of where we're going with custom elements. Uh, we're super excited that we can get this API to the outside world. And really what we want to see is you people start to play with it. You know, give us feedback on it. What works? What doesn't work? What are we missing? What are we not thinking about? What use cases you have that maybe we haven't considered, right? So I'd love to get your feedback. I'll be around the whole conference to come and chat to me about this. Just a quick note. So this is kind of new for the Angular community. It's not a new idea, though. Custom elements and web components have been around for a long time. But really, I would say in the past year or so, a bunch of other teams out in the world, so our friends at Ionic and their project using Stencil. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the new version of Ionic is written almost entirely in web components. And because, obviously, Angular already supports web components, they drop right back into an Angular application. Uh, Svelte is by the guy who writes Rollup, Rich Harris. Uh, the Polymer team has been d d kind of pushing web components for a long time. Skate.js is down there at the bottom. All of these teams I have talked to and worked with them over the past year, they've all been incredibly helpful in teaching us what we should be doing, we've been learning. Uh, and this is kind of the beginning for us. Uh, and they're, much, they're actually all ahead of us almost. But they've been really, really awesome, really, really helpful people. And I'm really, really grateful for that. So I'm super excited that we get to add Angular to this list, right? So custom elements will be available for you to use in 6.0. Uh, again, any questions, comments, feedback, come and see me. Thanks for listening.